Valentin is the business editor of the Epoch Times. He's flown in from Bavaria to be with us today, or was blown in, should I say. And if you don't know this, Epoch Times is an independent global news source that has been publishing on China since the turn of the century. Valentin's particular areas of expertise include global macroeconomic trends and financial markets, China and Bitcoin. Before joining the Epoch Times in 2012, he worked as a portfolio manager for BNP Paribas in Amsterdam, London, Paris and Hong Kong, and he is an alumnus of the Distinguished University of Edinburgh. So he's been, I think, probably visiting some pubs and old haunts uh, during the afternoon and yesterday. Now, I thought I would just start off this evening before handing over to Valentin by giving you a little extract uh, from a book, which is written by Jonathan Fenby, with whom I was on a panel in London last week. And he writes... Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore has noted the Chinese are in no hurry to displace the US as the number one power in the world and to carry the burden that is part and parcel of that position, unquote. On the one hand is a country with the world's largest economy, the top destination for international investment in 2013, allies stretching from Japan to the frontiers of Russia, many of them rich and some still growing accounting for 39% of global military spending. It enjoys enormous preponderance in weapons systems, a huge capacity for innovation, most of the world's top uh, universities, a reasonably young population, and may even be on the brink of an energy revolution with major economic effects. It has a functioning, if imperfect, legal system, free media, and global cultural appeal. Its political system can be dysfunctional, as in logjam over government spending and the budget in 2013. But it provides alternatives and safety valves, and much of its capacity for self-regeneration exists outside the Washington Beltway, the United States. On the other hand, is a state with an economy half the size of the other nations in nominal terms, ranking 94th globally in purchasing power parity per capita. It has substantial problems of ca capital misallocation and excess capacity, weak safety standards, a pollution crisis, endemic corruption, a dependence on imported resources and foreign advanced technology, plus a weak record in innovation. Its financial system is fragile and hemmed in with controls. It may possess foreign exchange reserves of more than $3 trillion, but it cannot use the money for domestic purposes because of its financial controls and for fear of setting off a slump from the value of its dollar assets that would undermine this treasure trove, China. This evening, we're going to be looking at China, and I hope that by giving you that description from Jonathan Fenby, I can set the scene, scene for uh, Valentin to talk to us. Valentin, thank you. Well, Rory, thank you. Uh, certainly, as an alumni of this uh, university, it's a great pleasure to be back. And uh, unfortunately, you just gave away basically my whole presentation by reading uh, what uh, Jonathan Femby uh, said. Um, so I just, uh, just want to uh, tell you in attendance that uh, in essentially what I'm going to tell you is not new. But what you're going to find uh, in, in business and especially economics, like sometimes if you just look at the same set of data with different eyes, you will uh, come to a different conclusion. Now, I also see a lot of uh, Chinese people here in the audience. I have to say, right from the beginning, this is a very uh, negative uh, presentation on the Chinese economy. But in the medium to long term, I have to say that I believe in the Chinese people. I believe in the hardworking attitude and the ingenuity. What I don't believe in is the Chinese Communist Party and the backward economic model they placed, uh, they placed on, on the country, despite the impressive looking numbers on the surface. So let's uh, go and uh, uncover what uh, lies behind the, behind the surface. And let's start here with uh, the fact that uh, Chinese growth is no miracle. They might hold the record for the fastest GDP growth over the last um, three decades or so, coming from a very low base. But a uh, miracle always means that uh, it cannot be explained by any type of normal uh, theories, but it can be explained after 
40 years of communist rule, the country was a uh, bar in crisis stricken after the Cultural Revolution in the 70s, had extremely cheap and abundant land and labor in the early 80s, favorable demographics, and it reaped, could uh, potentially reap the benefit of urbanization, FDI and technological improvement, uh, which it then uh, did, uh, thanks to Deng Xiaoping, who uh, opened up their economy and instituted some reforms. And, and that set the country off to its uh, massive growth path we, ha we have seen. Um, FDI and technological transfer and improvement was very uh, instrumental in, in boosting productivity and growth. However, even in the early stages, debt and investment fuel growth were at any point in time 30% of GDP, which is a very, very uh, high, high level. So uh, let us look at the, at the debt and where the growth uh, then really started to, to turn sour in 2008 and 2013 because China used these mercantilist, uh, classic mercantilist policies of undervaluing its currency, using the cheap inputs to uh, supply the world with um, any type of goods it might need. And um, that, again, it worked well until we had a financial crisis in the West. And the demand threatened to break away completely and then what do you do if you have all this capacity you have people employed who want to work and then all of a sudden you can't uh, employ them anymore because uh, because people aren't buying your, your stuff anymore so China embarked on a massive stimulus in 2008 2009 unlike what we are used to seeing in Europe and the United States where usually the central government would borrow and then spend uh, on uh, projects. In China, this went through the banking system, which has assets of now, I think it's around at the end of this year, $25 trillion on a GDP of 2013 of <coughs> 9.2 trillion, so that's roughly 260% of GDP, uh, whereas the US has uh, 15 trillion on a GDP of 16.8, which is roughly 90%. So you already see, whereas the US national debt is north of 100%. So the US finances its debt through bonds, the Chinese government does it through the banking system because they control the, the state banks. So they push that credit into the system. Now, how does credit function? It's essentially money. Uh, you don't print money and distribute the notes, but you print money via loans and then you build stuff with it. It registers a GDP straight away. That's how you get the big uh, growth figures. But this, um, this debt and I might say also the, the, the growth over the past 30 years certainly did come at a cost. Um, now it can be debated whether Japan or Europe during the industrialization did better or worse, but certainly uh, there are massive human rights issues, natural destruction and uh, disease because of uh, low safety standards in the factories and massive income inequality. I would argue that, that China certainly having had the opportunity to learn from the mistakes in the West uh, didn't uh, do well in, in that regard. And now in 2014, where, where are we in terms of growth and in terms of, uh, in terms of potential? Now, having had that debt expansion, that itself, similar to money printing, is not essentially a problem if you use the money for productive purposes. If I print money and I do something with it that has uh, added value, then there should be no inflation because productive capacity will be extended. And the same is true with debt. I print debt, I expand the, the balance sheet of the banks, and if uh, the project has uh, positive cash flow, added value, then I will be able to service the debt, repay the debt, and I end up with a higher capital stock. Now, my argument is, and we'll come back later to that, in China, that's not the case. It was mostly misallocated, as we've also um, uh, heard before. And then you have a problem, because if you misallocate capital and you don't generate the cash flow in order to service the debt, then you have a payment problem and, and bankruptcies. Uh, so let's look at the debt in detail again. Um, this is mostly based uh, on numbers I have from an American researcher called Richard Vague. And in stark contrast to what most uh, media outlets report, the most of the debt is actually concentrated at the corporate level at around 170% of GDP, whereas household level, we all heard of the housing bubble, which is a bubble, 
and it's ludicrously expensive, and we have seen prices come down, but nonetheless, residential real estate mortgages, where most of the household debt is concentrated, is only 23% of GDP, which is not a uh, uh, worrying figure. Central government and local government at 48, also okay. So we really see that, that most of the debt growth has been in the corporate sector. Total 240% of GDP, not too shabby. So again, just to note, uh, China, despite the low government debt, it has a lot of private debt. And what Richard Vague determined in his research, and I also find through my own research, is that if you have a certain growth of private debt over a certain period of time, here it says five years uh, and 18 percentage points, then you invariably have a financial crisis. This happened in Spain recently, it happened in the United States with a subprime. It happened in Japan, certainly after the bubble in the 80s. And here in China, we are going through proportions to 60% growth over five years, uh, which is uh, un, uh, unseen, essentially. So according to history, we should have a financial crisis anytime soon. When, uh, that's obviously harder to predict, and uh, we'll, come we'll come to that in a minute. And again, problem is the cash flow. We have seen now the corporate sector very much underwater with the first bankruptcies coming in uh, the beginning of this year, first official bankruptcy. But we have a Ponzi finance where debt is being rolled over. So you have interest uh, payments coming due, but they are being just rolled over into new loans. So, it's, uh, so we have artificial uh, extension of that debt. The non-performing loans, uh, the NPLs are low, uh, 1%, but rising official numbers, market implied numbers say 9%. To put things in perspective, the last time the banks went bankrupt in the early 2000s, uh, they had NPLs of 45%. And those loans, by the way, they're still around. They're very low now in terms of GDP because GDP has expanded a lot. But that's the type of thing the Chinese probably will do again, just evergreen the loans. The question is, um, how they're going to do it. Now to come back to the point that there will be no incremental cash flow for most of these investments, we have around 50 million empty houses that have just been used as a um, capital gains machine where people buy the houses, furnish them, and then don't use them because if you use them, they actually <laughs> lose half of the value and the prices have just gone up. Stock market has until recently underperformed, so you don't get any interest on, on your savings. So that was the, the preferred outlet for Chinese people to, to save. Then access production capacity, again, corporate sector, that's the real kicker. To give you a number here, uh, I really like this number, this is great. Uh, China has uh, 1,647 shipyards as of a year ago, compared to South Korea's 10 in Japan, Japanese 15. So on a per capita basis, even if you compare it to Japan, it's 10 times as many shipyards. Do you need as many shipyards? If you look at the Baltic Dry Index, uh, the answer is probably no. Um, so that just gives you, gives you an example. A more like a bigger aggregate figure puts the IMF, puts overall capacity utilization at about 60 to 70 percent. Worst sectors are definitely steel, but also uh, mining. And, and then the question is, uh, how far can you push the can? Because that's certainly something the Chinese government can do. If you, if you control the banks, you can push more credit into the system. But what good will it do? We have a slide here from uh, the data is from HSBC. The graph is from the Financial Times that says in 2005 to 2007, one additional unit of credit gave you at least one additional unit of output. Now you need three three units of credit to give you one additional unit of output. So you see the marginal utility is declining. And I have spoken to experts in New York who do on the ground research in China who say that now the corporate sector is maxed out. They don't even want to take the loans anymore from the banks. They just can't. The metrics, even by the thwarted uh, no bankruptcy system, they just don't pan out anymore. Now once you stall the growth in debt and in credit, automatically, because that has been your major growth generator, your GDP growth will slow less money around to actually service the debt, and then you go into a negative cycle of more bankruptcies, more bad loans, 
and ultimately most of that debt will uh, will be uh, written off. And another outlet mostly used by the local governments is unused uh, infrastructure like the empty sports stadia, the airports that don't don't have connections, and vanity uh, projects like uh, I think they rebuilt Venice, so <laughs> they do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so this is why I believe you will have a financial crisis. Now what you cannot underestimate is the ability of the uh, CCP to manage that crisis. It's a totalitarian regime. They control most of the um, manufacturing, but more importantly, the financial system. So what can they do? So the central government is responsible for the banks. So for all intents and purposes, if you shift the bad debt from the bank's balance sheet to the central government's balance sheet, it's just an accounting exercise and would ultimately if you want to pay it off, you would have to raise taxes. So the people would have to pay with taxes. Um, that leaves the Central Bank of China, the PBOC, which uh, like the Fed has done and the Japanese Central Bank has done, can just print money, which ultimately, if you print enough, will uh, result in inflation. And then the quick and, and, and painless route would be to just write off the bad debt, have a correction of asset prices, and that would then put the investors at the, at the mercy of the markets and they would have to pay for, for, for this. So mostly it's going to be the people who, who have to pay for, for the financial crisis. Now, if we look at Japan, they had similar debt levels. They also had a centrally planned economy. I mean, on the surface it was private, but it was really uh, through, through their um, corrupt uh, crony system was centrally managed. And uh, it's still taking them after 20 years. They still haven't uh, paid down the debt and they still have a massive overhang which uh, stifles their productivity and, and, and innovation and they have huge problems. So I would say at least uh, two or three decades for China also to work off the, the debt. Unless you do quick and, uh, quick and painless, but then you basically have to create a new banking system, maybe even launch a new currency and completely reshuffle the way the economy works. Um, a quick note here, actually not quick, this is a central point that people, many people don't understand is uh, let's talk about the FX reserves again. <laughs> um, Roddy's friend did a very good job in pointing out that you can't use them for domestic purposes. Now this is a simple accounting, uh, accounting rule. You have debts denominated in yuan, you can't pay for them in dollars. It just, uh, it's like oil and water, it just doesn't mix. Um, now, in theory, if you had an open capital account, so capital could flow freely, foreigners could own yuan and Chinese citizens could own dollars, then you could sell your dollars to the Chinese citizens, they would give you yuan, you could pay back the bad debts, but you don't have an open capital account, so you can't sell to your own citizens, vice versa. You cannot uh, get the yuan from the foreigners because they have been limited in owning yuan. So you don't have a market. You're sitting on trillions of reserve, but you don't have a market for uh, getting rid of them and actually extinguishing some of that bad debt. On top, even if you were able to do it, it would be a massively deflationary move, shrinking the balance sheet of the central bank and pushing the foreign exchange rate up, selling dollars, buying yuan. And uh, that's something you don't want to do if you're already facing a deflationary crisis. So ultimately, I think it's going to be a lot of, uh, there are going to be accounting tricks, shifting that around different places and just printing a lot of money, which ultimately will uh, result in uh, inflation. And I just have to admit, I forgot to uh, click the slide. Somebody <laughs> should have told me. <laughs> so you see, this is the growth in the banking system. This is the, these are the debt figures. This is the, the crisis, um, the crisis generator, the growth of the debt. Very quickly, here you've got the figures of the empty houses. This is the debt intensity where you can see on the left hand, China has a very skewed profile. Does Sorry, you speak up just a bit? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. And um, so where we are, this, these are the FX reserves where we just covered and um, Let's skip that for a second and talk about the reserve currency, which is the second point that many people seem to miss when talking about China or the uh, consensus is that China will at one point be the world's reserve currency, their economy will take over the United States. 
But what is a reserve currency, actually? Certainly a reserve currency is not a trade currency, which you can use and China is using on a bilateral basis to sum up trade. So Russia sells some gas to China and might get some yuan for it in exchange. And then China sells some products to Russia and they settle the score. And one of them might, up with a, might end up with a small balance of either ruble or yuan. And they can have that at a Chinese bank or uh, wherever they want to put it. Um, but what you don't want to have is if you have a large surplus like China itself, for example, or uh, Germany or Japan, used to have, <laughs> not anymore, you don't want to put it in a, what are essentially illiquid markets. Um, name one market in China which isn't illiquid. Most of the debt, so the investable assets, are bank loans. We have seen which are restructured and repackaged uh, re uh, as wealth management products, which are similar in uh, financial engineering to the infamous CDOs used uh, back in the days. And in terms of liquidity and transparency, they just don't measure up to anything that the United States can offer with the most transparent and liquid market, uh, with the treasury market being the deepest in the world. I mean, the yields aren't great at 1.5%. I would also argue the risks. Risk-reward ratio is not great, but at least you know what you're dealing with. In China, you don't know what you're dealing with. Then add to this things like the legal infrastructure, compliance issues, um, also language can be a problem. And you still have a closed capital account. So in terms of uh, actually investing your surplus, what the reserve currency is for, China doesn't have the, doesn't have the alternative. And then some side points. If you look at the things that people don't like about the dollar, which I don't like about the dollar, the Fed money printing, the deficits, the, uh, the, 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 the geopolitical factors, then you compare that to the balance sheet of the PBOC, which is 5.5 trillion in dollar terms, which is about which is about 59% of GDP and the Fed's balance sheet, with the, which is about 26.2% of GDP. Then talk about gold. Um, if the United States has all the gold, which they claim, then they have a much higher reserve ratio of the central bank's balance sheet because China only has, let's say, 4,000 tons. They say they only have 1,000, but they've been buying a lot and they've been confiscating their own production. So let's, let's say they have 4,000, then they still have only, at current prices, 3% reserved. So in all types of metrics, China just doesn't compare to the, to the US dollar, as bad as the dollar is. It's always a, a relative game. And in the future, despite these shortcomings, of course, the Chinese power structure has shifted. They're not what they were 30 years ago. So if there is a financial reform of the reserve currency and of the dollar system, then they, they will definitely have a say in the reform. And they might have an increase of IMF shares and have some more influence uh, through that route. Now, last but certainly not least, let's talk about the, the structural inefficiency of the, of the Chinese economy, why they'll never be able to overtake the United States economy, certainly not in per capita terms, because of the, of the quick emphasis on quick and easy growth, you had a lot of uh, byproducts, a lot of negative byproducts, like natural destruction. In 2004, I believe the regime put out a report putting it at 3% of GDP annually that are lost irrevocably in natural resources. So you have to subtract that number. Every time you calculate GDP, that was the last time they actually put out that report. They stopped afterwards. Um, you have massive resource waste that puts the inefficiency of the whole economy in perspective. So I think those are 2013 or 2012 numbers. China uses 65% of world iron ore on a GDP of 10%. So now if they want to grow further and they want to have a share of 15%, will they use all of the iron ore? I mean, how is this going to work? Cement figures are similar, where we have, um, where are the cement figures? So they use, uh, they in 2008, they used one ton per capita of cement per year, which is in crazy. And in 2012 already, they used 1.62% uh, per capita. So it's becoming more and more inefficient. Same with, uh, we looked at the credit intensity. We have a capital to output ratio, which was two, two to one 
a couple of years ago, now it's 5.5 to 1. So everything is becoming uh, inefficient. And also the, the wages have risen to an extent where Boston Consulting now puts it at 95% of US cost to produce in China. So all this cheap land, cheap labor, land prices certainly have risen. That has come uh, to a, a stop. The currency pack and the closed capital account has, has uh, stopped financial reform to, from happening and they haven't been able to uh, import financial innovation with all its drawbacks. But certainly if you have your, your economy exposed, you face much more competitive pressure and you're uh, more bound to, to act more efficient, efficiently. But they can't afford it because they have been subsidizing the productive sector through low rates. Uh, through low lending rates and the consumers get low rates on their deposits. So uh, the whole economy is basically structurally inefficient. I blame it on the, on the communists, which have a um, very bad track record at innovation. And uh, later I'd be very interested uh, to hear from Dr. Shen whether she can, uh, she can tell me about one innovation the Chinese came up with in the last 30 years. I know certainly in the last 1,000 years they did a lot of good things. But only one type of Google, Tesla, Facebook, you know, a big thing they have come up with. Um, instead of just copying all the technology they can get their hand off, because that's communist ideology is, um, is uh, penalizing people for taking risks. And innovating certainly means taking risks. And the education system is still very backward, which is why most of the smartest people and the richest people still want to come to the United States to be educated. And then they want to stay there. So to sum up, OK, let's talk about the demographics real quick, which was a factor supporting the growth. Now it's not anymore, thanks to the one-child policy, about 300 million uh, people missing now, thanks to abortion and infanticide, about 60 million women in particular, which have been targeted um, to, for abortion and infanticide. And the uh, working age population is now declining. That's official. And the added benefit of urbanization, according to some, bene uh, to some estimates, the IMF says it will end in 2020. Some other people say it already ended. So that's not working in its favor anymore. Now, uh, on a positive note, what needs to change? The whole crony CCP corrupt uh, system needs to change. We're basically still, despite a seemingly capitalist stock market system, uh, the CCP still controls most of the factors of production which is uh, what the communist uh, ideology always has been, where the party controls the factors of production, has enriched uh, a small fraction of the population beyond their wildest dreams, which is why the Gini coefficient of wealth inequality is uh, among the worst, much, much worse than in the United States, which is also not great. And um, it's just very um, unproductive because for a true market economy and to unleash the, the potential of the Chinese people, everybody needs to be able to compete under fair circumstances, not based on connections and party membership. And for that to change, I hope that uh, Xi Jinping will continue his reforms, not just to strengthen his own foothold on power, but to actually uh, transition China to a democratic uh, system and, uh, and just reform everything. I mean, ideally, they do everything in one fell swoop through a crisis, when they have the crisis, reform the political system, reform the financial system, launch a new currency, and then basically start from scratch. I mean, that's obviously talking uh, best case scenario. And that's certainly possible. Impact on the West, just to finish off, shouldn't be too big in terms of finance, because China is still uh, secu secluded financially. They are not as connected, not like here when the United States has a credit crisis. Everybody doesn't get dollar credit anymore. Everybody owes dollar credit, a lot of trade is affected in dollar credit, that's not going to happen. Whereas, um, whereas in China you have, you will feel it in aggregate demand, where uh, people already in Brazil and Australia are feeling the heat due to the lack of, um, lack of slowing demand from China. And also countries like Germany and Japan, which export a lot of capital goods, and even the United States, which also exports a lot of capital goods, they will feel it. But the impact should be, should be limited. Uh, obviously, there will be a recession, and then hopefully, I mean, if they go for the quick and painless solution, then China can actually add to world GDP because now it's subtracting because of its massive current account surplus. Those are my hopes, and I will um, 
I will conclude with that. Sorry about the, the slides that you, I hope you were able to, to follow the presentation nonetheless. Thank you, Thank you very much.